Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, so we're going to discuss the final class of arrhythmias that we're going to uh, go over in this video, which is bundle branch block. Okay, right, so we'll begin by um, drawing a picture of the heart, and then we'll discuss what bundle branch block actually is going to be. Okay, so we'll use our normal picture of the heart, which is this cross section through the heart where we can uh, show all four of the chambers of the heart. So up here, of course, is the left atrium. Down here is the right atrium. And then we'll have the two ventricles, left ventricle here, and the right ventricle here. And we'll also take the time to draw the heart's electrical conduction system on here uh, because, of course, bundle branch block is going to involve problems with the heart's electrical conduction system, so we need to have it drawn on our diagram. So firstly, I'll put on the atrioventricular septum, this uh, fibrous insulation between the atria and ventricles. Next, let's have the sinoatrial node, so I'll colour this in in orange up here. Uh, then we'll have the atrioventricular node, at the one window through the atrioventricular septum, shown here in blue. And now let's put on the conduction pathways. So firstly, the atrial conduction pathways. Uh, so we'll have the free internodal pathways, the anterior internodal pathway, the middle internodal pathway, and the posterior internodal pathway. Uh, and then uh, the interatrial pathway, Backman's bundle, which delivers the electrical signal from the sinoatrial node to the left atrium. Then let's put on the ventricular conduction pathway, so firstly the bundle of Hiss uh, after the atrioventricular node, and then it will split into two, one portion that will then uh, stimulate the right ventricle called the right bundle branch, and then the other which will stimulate the left ventricle called the left bundle branch. So I'll just label up the right and left bundle branch. So here, this is the right bundle branch, so RBB for short, and here, this is the left bundle branch, so LBB for short. Okay, so there's my picture of the heart. So in bundle branch block, the principle is very similar to what happens in uh, third degree AV nodal block. Uh, indeed, what's going to happen is we're going to obtain some sort of damage to either the right bundle branch or the left bundle branch, and that's going to prevent the electrical signal from conducting along uh, that bundle branch. Okay, so what could cause the damage to the right bundle branch or the left bundle branch? Well, obviously there are lots of different things, but the major one that um, leaps to mind is potentially ischemic damage, a myocardial infarction that might have affected one of the bundle branches. Uh, so a, a large period of the a large portion of the heart may well have uh, suffered ischemic damage, and if that portion of the heart involves one of the bundle branches, then of course we're going to lose those cells of that bundle branch, and then that bundle branch is no longer going to successfully conduct the electrical signal, because the tissue won't be replaced with normal cardiomyocytes, it will be replaced with scar tissue which won't be conductive. Okay, so myocardial infarction involving either the uh, right bundle branch or the left bundle branch is then going to lead to right or left bundle branch block. Okay, so this is the basic principle then. In right bundle branch block, you're going to get some sort of damage to the right bundle branch here that means that the electrical signal will not pass beyond that area of damage. So this uh, line here is representing damage to the right bundle branch, which will lead to right bundle branch block, which for short is abbreviated to RBBB. Okay, so RBB means right bundle branch, RBBB means right bundle branch block, and equivalently for the left bundle branch here, so if you get some damage to the left bundle branch here, that's going to lead to left bundle branch block, which for short can be abbreviated down to LBBB. Okay, so that's uh, the basic principle of what right bundle branch block and left bundle branch block are. Damage to the bundle branches on either side, which are going to cause uh, failure of the electrical signal to propagate beyond at that point. So let's think about what's going to happen in both cases. So we'll start off with right bundle branch block. So we're assuming now that we have damage to the right bundle branch, uh, and the electrical signal is now no longer going to propagate beyond that damaged point. So now, 
how is the electrical signal going to propagate through the ventricles? Well, let's think about it from the start. So the sinoatrial node will generate an electrical signal which will propagate down the atria. Uh, it'll get to the atrioventricular node normally. It will propagate through the atrioventricular node down the bundle of Hiss. Okay. Uh, then it will go down the two bundle branches, but it won't get very far in the case of the right bundle branch because there's right bundle branch block. Uh, so the electrical signal will die once it reaches this area um, that is blocked. However, it will propagate down the left bundle branch because that's perfectly intact, and therefore it will be unleashed on the left ventricle here. You'll get normal left ventricular uh, depolarization, okay, so the electrical signal will propagate through the left ventricle in the normal way, but then Remember, the ventricles aren't insulated from one another. The electrical signal from the left ventricle can spread to the right ventricle. So what will then happen is the electrical signal will um, propagate from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. So you'll get a cardiac vector in this sort of direction here. Okay. So the wave of depolarization will firstly spread over the left ventricle in the normal way, i.e., I mean from subendocardial myocardium to subepicardial myocardium, and then it will spread down to the right ventricle. Okay, so that's what's going to happen then in that right bundle branch block. Now the equivalent in left bundle branch block. So this time it's the left bundle branch that has got the uh, damage uh, to it. So now, starting from the beginning, the sinoatrial node will generate the electrical signal which will uh, propagate down the atria in the normal way through the atrioventricular node, through the bundle of Hiss. This time it won't go down the left bundle branch, but it will go down the right bundle branch. So you'll get normal right ventricular depolarization from subendocardial to subepicardial, and then it will propagate up uh, to the left uh, ventricle. So again, you'll get a sort of cardiac vector going in this sort of direction. Uh, the wave of depolarization will spread from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. So clearly, uh, for the two examples, the cardiac vectors are pointing in the opposite direction. For um, right bundle branch block, the cardiac vector <coughs> Excuse me. The cardiac vector, when it's spreading from the left ventricle to the right ventricle, will be going in this direction. For uh, left bundle branch block, the cardiac vector, where it's spreading from the right ventricle to the left ventricle, will be pointing in the opposite direction. Now, lead to ECG is quite a disappointing one to watch bundle branch block uh, on. And the reason is that if we think about these cardiac vectors where the electrical signal is propagating from um, the left ventricle to the right ventricle in the case of right bundle branch block, and from the right ventricle to the left ventricle in the case of uh, left bundle branch block, those cardiac vectors are sort of perpendicular almost to the uh, vector between the right arm and the left leg, which is where we're uh, taking the electrical potential difference between in a lead to ECG. So are we actually going to be able to see those cardiac vectors? Well, not very well because they're perpendicular um, to the axis of the lead two. Okay, so we're not going to be able to actually see that cardiac vector particularly impressively on a lead to ECG. You can use other leads of a 12 lead ECG to see this far better, so some of the chest leads will show this far more impressively than uh, the lead to ECG, but because we haven't really talked about uh, the other leads of a 12 lead ECG, I'm not going to go into that in detail. Okay, If you're aware of uh, how a 12 lead ECG works and the fact that you have all of these different leads looking at electrical potential differences between different points, then you will hopefully be aware that uh, you'll be able to find a lead that has, uh, well, which will better illustrate those cardiac vectors that are propagating in either this direction or this direction. Okay, but what you will see uh, in a right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block on a lead to ECG is a much broader QRS complex. Um, so the P wave will be perfectly normal, of course. The interval uh, between the P wave and the beginning of the QRS complex will be normal, but then uh, the actual QRS complex will be hugely distorted, uh, and it will be much broader. Usually the QRS complex is extremely narrow, so usually, of course, the QRS complex looks looks like this. And the reason it's so narrow, uh, the reason it takes so little time is because the bundle branches deliver the electrical signal all over the ventricles, and they conduct it 
very, very fast. So the specialized ventricular conduction system is very, very fast at delivering the electrical signal, okay? So they deliver it all over the ventricles very, very quickly. So ventricular depolarization occurs very, very quickly. Whereas if you're getting, um, well, if it's the case that the electrical signal has to propagate through the actual contractile cardiomyocytes, it's going to take much longer for all of the ventricle to actually receive the wave of depolarization. So we know in right bundle branch block and in left bundle branch block, the electrical signal is having to propagate from ventricle to ventricle, and that's going to take much longer to propagate. So you'll end up with a much broader QRS complex. Okay, it won't look like this as well. It will be distorted uh, in complicated ways, uh, but that's one of the typical features that you can spot on a uh, any of the ECG leads of a 12 lead ECG that the QRS complex is much longer if you're suffering from right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block and the reason is that the electrical signal is having to propagate from one ventricle to the other and that takes time. Okay, right, so that's um, bundle branch block then. Now, is this particularly problematic? Well, the answer is no. This is called an arrhythmia because the definition of an arrhythmia is any distortion of the electrical activity within the heart. So, of course, this is an aberrant uh, electrical signal within the heart. The electrical signaling in the heart is aberrant if you've got uh, right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block. However, is this actually going to damage the function of the heart? Remember, the function of the heart it's a very important organ. It pumps blood around the body. That is its function. Okay, its function is not to have a perfect electrical signal. Okay, its function is to pump blood around the body. Yes, having a perfect electrical signal makes it very good at doing that job, but this aberrant electrical signal might still do the job, and indeed it really does still do the job. Okay, yes, now what we have is the electrical signal having to propagate from one ventricle to the other, but we're still going to get both ventricles contracting reasonably synchronously. Yes, one will contract slightly before the other, but it, they're still contracting reasonably at the same time. So this isn't really going to damage cardiac output that much, so it's not a particularly serious problem. And what is more serious is asking why has it happened? So what was it that damaged the right bundle branch or the left bundle branch? Because often it does indicate, as we said, ischemic heart disease, and that is much more dangerous. So really, if someone has got right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block, the your bigger concern isn't the aberrant electrical signaling in the heart now, it's asking what actually caused that, uh, and is it going to cause more damage? And if it's ischemic heart disease, obviously that is very likely to cause more damage, uh, so we'll need to be treated. Okay, so that then concludes the discussion of bundle branch block, and we have now finished our final arrhythmia that I wish to discuss in this video. What we're going to end this video on cardiac arrhythmias with is just uh, a reminder of all of the antiarrhythmic drugs that we've been through in this video, and I want to finally classify them into the Vaughan Williams uh, classification of antiarrhythmic drugs. Okay, so there are many different classifications for antiarrhythmic drugs, some far more sophisticated than others. The Vaughan Williams classification is the one that is often uh, put in textbooks because it's fantastically simple. It's not particularly sophisticated, but it's fantastically simple and it's easy to remember. So it's the one that uh, most people know. If you're a consultant cardiologist, of course, you will probably know more sophisticated classifications of the antiarrhythmic drugs. But if you're just a medical student, the Vaughan Williams classification is the one to learn. Okay, so let me just write it out if my pen's going to work. So this is how you spell their name. So it's named, I believe, after the people who actually came up with it. Uh, so Vaughan and Williams. Um, I believe that they're probably their surnames. So we're going to discuss the Vaughan Williams classification of antiarrhythmic drugs. Now, as I say, we've been discussing this as we've been going through. The way I wanted to discuss antiarrhythmic drugs is I wanted to come to them as we actually needed them. So as we went through the different arrhythmias uh, and uh, saw the pathology associated with each of them, I wanted to discuss the drugs straight after that so that everything was nicely motivated. I thought that was the better way of doing it rather than introducing all the drugs right at the start, explaining their mechanisms and then showing uh, where they're used. I, 
felt that the better way of doing it, the more motivated way of doing it, was to introduce the drugs as we went along. The downside to this is it's difficult then to classify them uh, into their different categories as if you do it in that way. So now we're coming back and finishing off by categorising them into the different classes, but I have mentioned which classes the drugs are in uh, when we were going through. And of course there are some drugs that don't fit into any Vaughan Williams classification. Okay, right, so in the Vaughan Williams classification of antiarrhythmic drugs then, there are four categories. So there is class one, uh, Vaughan, well, class one antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, there are class two antiarrhythmic drugs, there are class three antiarrhythmic drugs, and then there are class four antiarrhythmic drugs. So let's begin, of course, with class one. Class one is the most complicated. Class one are those use-dependent blockers of voltage-gated sodium channels. So the target of class one antiarrhythmic drugs are voltage-gated sodium channels. And by the way, I'm going to say this, this is really important to say right now. These classifications, they are based on the target of the drug. They're based on what does the drug actually affect. They are not based on chemical classification. I mean, often we classify drugs according to their chemical structure. Uh, so, for instance, the dihydropyridines, they all have uh, very similar chemical structures. All the penicillin antibiotics have a core structure that they all share, and they just have a different R group. In the Vaughan Williams classification of antiarrhythmic drugs, we classify drugs not by their chemical structures. They might have completely different chemical structures and be in the same class. We categorize them according to what actual biological structure they are targeting. Okay, so class 1 antiarrhythmic drugs are going to be use-dependent blockers of voltage-gated sodium channels. And remember what use-dependent blockers means. It means that they don't bind to the resting voltage-gated sodium channel, they bind to the open state, and they also bind to the inactivated state. And remember, they have that incredible property of stabilizing the inactivated state so that even once the electrical potential difference has returned to below negative 40 millivolts, um, the channel will remain in the inactivated state for much longer than it would usually until the drug has fallen off and then it will return back to the resting state. Okay, so um, these class 1 antiarrhythmic drugs, they're further split into three different categories and this is that really complicated stuff that we discussed uh, being the difference between uh, flecainide and lidocaine. Okay, so I'm bringing it all back up now. So class 1A, class 1B, and class 1C. And the difference between these different classes of class 1 drugs, these subclasses if you like, is the kinetics, i.e. how quickly they bind on and bind off. And unfortunately, even the um, order in which it goes through isn't in a logical order. So 1B are the fast on, fast off. Okay, so fast on, fast off. They're the ones which bind to the voltage-gated sodium channels extremely rapidly, and then once uh, the electrical potential difference has returned back down to below negative 40 millivolts, will come off extremely rapidly. And remember, the example that we gave there was the drug lidocaine, and I will uh, just remind you of this in a little bit more detail once I've uh, written it all out. So 1B is the fast on, fast off. 1C is the slow on, slow off. Okay, so the example that we had the slow on, slow off drug was flecainide. And remember, we used that to slow down uh, the conduction of the action potential along the cell membranes of um, Hispokinji system uh, cardiomyocytes. So slow off, slow, slow on, slow off. Uh, use-dependent voltage-gated sodium channel blockers are the 1Cs, and then the 1As aren't really used anymore, they're even more complicated, they're in between, so they're intermediate speed on and intermediate speed off. Uh, now, I didn't mention any of these drugs as we were going through, but I'll give you a few examples now. So, as I say, they're not really used as antidysrhythmics anymore, but an example for historical interest is quinidine. Another example is desopyramide. They're quite famous drug names. You might hear them referred to occasionally. Uh, so, know that they are intermediate speed on and intermediate speed off uh, use-dependent blockers of voltage-gated sodium channels. So, even this... You know, even the names don't 
aren't particularly in order. It would have been nice if 1A was the fast on, fast off, 1B was the intermediate ones, and 1C was the slow on, slow off, but they didn't even manage to do that, unfortunately. So there are the uh, subclasses of class 1 antiarrhythmic drugs. So let's just remind ourselves of what this kinetic stuff actually means. Okay, because it is so complicated and I would just like to repeat it because uh, it's worth repeating. Okay, so um, this is basically something that physical chemists are absolutely brilliant at understanding and biologists are not very good at understanding. Physical chemists are fantastic at understanding this because they deal with this problem all the time. Their entire course is about this problem. Okay, it's about the difference between thermodynamics and kinetics. So thermodynamics in chemistry is all about if you put in um, some reactants and let them react and you let it reach a dynamic equilibrium, so you have a huge amount of time, you wait for absolutely ages, as long as, you know, as much time as it needs, and you wait for a dynamic equilibrium to occur, what will that dynamic equilibrium actually be? In the context of um, biology, we could think of a simpler example than use-dependent um, Block, uh, block A, because use-dependent block A makes this much more complicated than it needs to be. If we just think about having a receptor here, okay, so let's say this is the receptor, so I'll colour it in, in red here. Here's the receptor, and we've got lots of receptors, okay, so I'll draw a few more of them. So you could think of these as being voltage-gated sodium channels, but as I say, the voltage-gated sodium channels, it's complicated because they're use-dependent. That makes it even more complicated. So just to explain the difference between thermodynamics and kinetics, I'm going to take uh, an example where it's not use-dependent, and this will illustrate the principle that we've got here. Okay, so here are some receptors. So we've got lots of receptors, and you can think of them as some sort of G-protein receptor. Okay, or, or G-protein coupled receptor, rather. And then we've got lots of the drug molecules around as well. So here are drug molecules in orange here. Okay, so we've got a certain concentration of receptors, and we've now put in a certain concentration of the drug. Okay, now, if we let this run, and let's say the drug is capable of binding to the receptor, if we now wait for a huge amount of time, and let it reach equilibrium, what will happen is a certain fraction of the receptors will end up with drug molecules bound to them. Okay, if you wait long enough, it will reach a dynamic equilibrium where there is a certain fraction of receptors with drug molecules bound to them. Let's say it ends up at being 30% of the receptors end up with a drug molecule bound to them at the equilibrium. And this percentage will clearly depend on what concentration of the drug you put in. If you have a much higher concentration of the drug, then when you reach the dynamic equilibrium, you'll have a much higher percentage of receptors occupied with a drug molecule bound to them. And those of you who know pharmacodynamics will know that there is an equation that gives you the fraction of the receptors that will end up with the drug molecule bound to them, known as the occupancy equation, uh, and that depends on what drug concentration you put in. Okay, so that's the concept of thermodynamics in um, chemistry, in physical chemistry. That is all about if you have as much time in the world and you wait for a dynamic equilibrium to arise, what will the dynamic equilibrium actually look like? In the case of uh, biology here, uh, we're thinking about how many, um, what fraction of the receptors are actually going to end up with a drug molecule bound. Kinetics, the other part of physical chemistry is about how long will it actually take for you to reach the equilibrium, okay? Because these drug molecules might bind to the receptor extremely rapidly, and therefore you might reach this point of having 30% of the receptors occupied. You might reach your dynamic equilibrium extremely rapidly, okay, in a few milliseconds maybe. Whereas in other cases, the drug molecule might actually bind to the receptor much more slowly and then come off the receptor much more slowly, and therefore it will take you much, much longer for the dynamic equilibrium to actually arise. So that's the difference between thermodynamics and kinetics. Thermodynamics is about, at dynamic equilibrium, what actually is stable. Kinetics is about how long will it actually take to reach that dynamic equilibrium.
Okay, and that's what the difference is here, okay? This is all about the kinetics of the drug, how quickly it will actually take for you to reach the dynamic equilibrium that is stable with these drugs. So lidocaine, it binds to the voltage-gated sodium channels when they are in the open state extremely rapidly, okay? So, if you have a cardiomyocyte, and I'll draw a picture here, if we have a cardiomyocyte here, and I stimulate this cardiomyocyte to fire an action potential, then what's going to happen is when all of those voltage-gated sodium channels open, lidocaine molecules will very rapidly bind to those voltage-gated sodium channels, and you will reach the dynamic equilibrium for lidocaine being bound to those voltage-gated sodium channels. Uh, you'll reach whatever fraction is the dynamic equilibrium for the voltage-gated sodium channels being occupied with lidocaine in that single action potential, okay? Then when you go into the inactivated state, the drug molecule will remain bound there, and then when you repolarize the electrical potential difference back to below negative 40 millivolts, the uh, drug molecules will then start coming off, and they'll come off really quickly, and all of the, uh, you know, in between the concurrent action potentials, so before the next one comes along, all of the lidocaine molecules will then come off, and you'll be back to the beginning where all of the voltage-gated sodium channels are back in the resting state. Okay, so lidocaine comes on and off very quickly, and this allows us to use it to block those ectopic foci, okay, because it has this property that it will block cardiomyocytes from firing action potentials if they're being stimulated too rapidly. And the reason, remember, for that is that if they're being stimulated too rapidly, um, then the lidocaine molecules won't have had time to come off by the time you stimulate for the next action potential. Then you'll, when you do stimulate for the next action potential, you'll be taking the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane back up to above uh, negative 40 millivolts, okay? Uh, and then there's no desire for the drug to come off anymore. And those voltage-gated sodium channels which had recovered in that interval period, that short, that too short interval period, will then just be re-blocked. So you just continue blocking your voltage-gated sodium channels. And the amount of sodium you actually let in when those small number of voltage-gated sodium channels which had recovered actually do open isn't enough for you to get saltatory conduction of the action potential, so you get no action potential. And that re continuous re-blocking of the voltage-gated sodium channels, which have managed to recover in the intervals, will continue happening for as long as you continue this too rapid stimulation. So that's why lidocaine is useful for that, because it comes on and off so quickly. In a single action potential, it will reach its dynamic equilibrium where all of the voltage-gated sodium channels, or the maximum fraction of voltage-gated sodium channels that it can block and bind to at one state, i.e. its thermodynamic equilibrium, are blocked. Okay? Right, so we give lidocaine in a dose that can actually produce a blockade of voltage-gated sodium channels that is quite high, okay? A large fraction of the voltage-gated sodium channels are going to be blocked so that um, we can actually prevent uh, enough sodium coming in to uh, allow the um, conduction of the action potential by saltatory conduction. In contrast, flecainide, it doesn't get to its thermodynamic equilibrium just with one cycle of the action potential. So when you have your cardiomyocyte here exposed to flecainide and you stimulate it to fire an action potential, very few flecainide molecules will actually get to bind onto those voltage-gated sodium channels in that uh, single action potential. Okay, It won't have reached its maximum occupancy of the voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay, what will happen is it will be like this. When you stimulate the action potential, some of the uh, voltage-gated sodium channels will now get flecainide bound. So if we have a graph here, okay, and in fact this should have gone from zero, so I, um, um, how am I going to fix this now? We'll, we'll start down here. I'll draw it in orange rather than black, so ignore that portion there. So if we've got time here, okay, and we've got percentage occupancy here. Okay, so when you first the fire the first action potential, we're going to get some flecainide molecules binding to the voltage-gated sodium channels when they're in the open state. Then, of course, you'll go around the cycle, so they'll go into the inactivated state. The flecainide molecules will still be bound there, okay? Uh, but then when you repolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, uh, then you'll start to get flecainide molecules unbinding, but as I say, they're slow off as well, so 
only a few will come off, and then when you refire another action potential, then you'll put a few more on, and then in between a few will come off, and you're building up towards the dynamic equilibrium. So with each action potential, you're progressively getting more and more flaconide molecules bound to voltage-gated sodium channels, and then it will approach its dynamic equilibrium. So eventually it will sort of get to its dynamic equilibrium like this, where there is a certain fraction of the voltage-gated sodium channels effectively continuously blocked and useless. Okay, so we give flecknide in a dose where the maximum fraction of voltage-gated sodium channels at dynamic thermodynamic equilibrium that it can block uh, is quite low because we don't want it to be very high because then it will just stop all action potentials from conducting. Okay, so we give it at a dose where it can block a non-trivial fraction of voltage-gated sodium channels, but not enough to stop at all action potentials from conducting. And the idea, of course, here is then that it's going to reduce the amount of sodium that will come in in the action potentials, in the upstroke of the action potentials, in the his Purkinje cardiomyocytes, uh, and therefore the action potential will conduct at a slower rate because the saltatory conduction will spread for or spread a smaller distance, so you'll have to uh, go, you'll have to cross the membrane in smaller little chunks. Okay, so that's the difference then between these different types of voltage gated sodium channel uh, use dependent blockers. That is a really complicated concept, so if you're struggling with that, don't feel guilty, just uh, keep going over it in your head and hopefully you'll eventually understand it. Okay, right, and as I say, the 1As are very rarely used, but they have properties in between the fast-on and fast-off and slow-on and slow-off voltage-gated sodium channels blockers. Okay, so now on to the easier classes of drugs. Let's go on to class 2 antiarrhythmic drugs in the Vaughan Williams classification. So the class 2 drugs are the beta blockers. Okay, so you can have the non-selective beta blockers, which block both beta 1 and beta 2 receptors. The obvious example being propranolol, and then you can have the selective beta-1 blockers because after all we're using these drugs because of their effect on the heart, and it's the beta-1 receptors that are on the heart, uh, so we only need blockade of the beta-1 receptors, so examples of beta-1 selective beta blockers are atenolol and metoprolol. So I'll just write those down, so we've got Propranolol is the example of the non-selective one. It's still often used, um, but as I say, it's not selective for beta-1. It will also antagonize beta-2. And then we have the selective beta-1 blockers, atenolol and metoprolol. So how do those drugs work? What are those drugs used to do? Well, they will block beta-1 receptors on cardiomyocytes. And remember, this has many effects. In the sinoatrial node, the blockade of the beta-1 receptors will lead to a reduction in the frequency at which the sinoatrial node cells are generating action potentials. Okay. In the atrioventricular node, blockade of the beta-1 receptors will slow down conduction of the action potential through the AV node. And those are the main two reasons that we would uh, use beta blockers uh, to treat arrhythmias. So propranolol, atenolol, and metoprolol are all the examples of beta blockers that we've seen in this video. Class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs, then. These target voltage-gated potassium channels and uh, they block voltage-gated potassium channels, which then leads to the repolarization phase of the cardiac action potential taking longer. So the one example of a class 3 antiarrhythmic drug that we've seen in this video is amiodarone. And remember, we used that to try and treat uh, circus rhythms. The idea was that if we had a very rapid circus rhythm, then potentially if we prolonged the cardiac action potential, then it would kill the circus rhythm because by the time, uh, well, by the, in the short amount of time between the circus rhythm going round the re-entrant loop, it might be the case that the cardiomyocytes at the start of the loop hasn't now got back into the resting state and isn't yet ready to conduct another action potential. So if I just draw a little picture for this. So let's say here is our re-entrant loop here. And of course, in the circus rhythm concept, the electrical signal is just going round and round and round. But of course, this relies on the cardiomyocyte here being ready to conduct another electrical signal by the time it's gone round the re-entrant loop. 
if we are lengthening the cardiac action potential, then we are lengthening the refractory period. Okay, so it's going to take this cardiomyocyte longer to get ready to conduct another electrical signal. So there is the potential for us to kill the circus room in this way with this drug. Of course, amiodarone paradoxically is also capable of causing arrhythmias because we know if you prolong the cardiac action potential, that causes long QT syndrome, and that can result in triggered activity in cardiomyocytes, which can then result in that extremely dangerous arrhythmia, torsade de poids. So amiodarone use with care. Okay, but that's class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs. Now, class 4 antiarrhythmic drugs. These are calcium channel blockers. They block voltage-gated calcium channels of the L type. Okay, and remember, we use those calcium channel blockers that are selective for L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, reasonably selective anyway, that are in the myocardium. Uh, so the phenylalkylamine, verapamil, is an example, and the benzothiazepine, diltiazem, is also another drug that's often used. We don't use the dihydropyridines because they're better at blocking L-type voltage-gated calcium channels in the vascular smooth muscle cells than in the cardiac muscle cells. Okay, and remember, these will uh, again be given in doses where they block a small fraction of the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels in the atrioventricular node cardiomyocytes, and therefore they reduce the amount of calcium that is coming in in the upstroke of the atrioventricular nodal cardiomyocytes action potential, and therefore they slow saltatory conduction of that action potential along the cell membrane of the atrioventricular nodal cardiomyocyte. So it's a very similar principle to flecainide here. Again, you will give them in a dose where they don't block all of the channels, they just block a small fraction, uh, which will then slow conduction, but not stop conduction. If you gave them in two higher doses, then they block a huge great fraction of the channels, and then you get not enough sodium or calcium coming in to actually get any conduction of the uh, electrical signal at all. Okay, so you'd block uh, all heart activity, and that would not be a good idea. Okay, then there are two drugs that we've mentioned throughout the video that don't fit into any one of the four Vaughan Williams categories for uh, antiarrhythmic drugs. Those examples are digoxin, which, remember, worked by a mysterious mechanism to increase parasympathetic uh, stimulation to the heart, and hence slowed conduction of the uh, electrical signal through the uh, atrioventricular node. And also, adenosine was another drug that we mentioned, which can be given intravenously, and again, it will slow the conduction of the electrical signal through the atrioventricular node by acting on A1 receptors. But those drugs don't fit into any one of the Vaughan Williams classes of antiarrhythmic drugs. Okay, so with that, we will finish this video on cardiac arrhythmias. Well done for getting to the end of it.